Good morning. It's great to be with you this morning. I want to thank everyone for all of your prayers as uh, we've just made our move this past week to our new house and just really excited to be there and so many of you uh, played a real part in that and praying for us and we had food coming in from so many different people this coming week so Brooke hardly had to cook and so that was a real blessing as well and of course many of you helped with the move as well. I know Jill has been very busy painting at our house and so we're thankful for all the work she's doing and and just all of you guys just really thankful for each one of you. I also wanted to mention just before we jump into the Word of God uh, that tonight at 6.30 we are continuing our series with, it's called Behold Your God, Rethinking God Biblically, um, and the teacher, it's a video series that we're going through for the evening services, um, and his name is Pastor John Snyder, and so he's considering the attributes of God, and it's, it's a really interesting study because he, he talks about someone throughout history uh, that God has um, really especially used. Um, and so last week we looked at A.W. Tozer, and then there's some pastors and theologians that comment at the end of the video as well, and just a real blessing and a real challenge uh, to many of the misconceptions that we might have about God that need to be changed um, as it's confronting with the tr- confronted with the truth of the Word of God. And so just really want to encourage you to come uh, and be a part of that. Well, we are continuing in the Gospel of Matthew, and so you can turn your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 7. Uh, We are looking at verses 1 through 6 this morning, and the title of this message is simply, Do Not Judge. Do Not Judge. So Matthew chapter 7, beginning to read in verse 1. Jesus said, Judge not that you be not judged, for with the measure of judgment you pronounce, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is the log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give to dogs what is holy. And do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. Well, let's open in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the word of God. And as we turn to it at this time, we ask that you would open up our eyes to understand what this passage is, passage is about and that we would make a rightful application to it in our own lives. Uh, God, we thank you for Jesus Christ uh, and all that he's done for us, that although we deserve to be judged, Jesus came and bore the judgment of God in our place so that we would be spared uh, from receiving the wrath of God ourselves. So God, we thank you for Christ, and it is our desire to worship him and for our understanding and sight of him to enlarge. Um, God, there is so much for us to learn. Uh, God, we are so weak and Lord, there's so many areas in all of our lives where we um, have so many struggles and are just constantly in need of your grace to to move and to work within us so that we might work and will uh, for your good pleasure. And so, God, may that take place in our lives today. God, if there is any hardness of heart, uh, God, I pray that you would soften them. Uh, God, that you, that we would become sensitive, very sensitive towards the truth of your word, and that we would not try to justify anything that is sinful in your sight, uh, but instead that it would be brought to light, that it would be exposed, and that we would see it for what it is, and that we would turn and live. God, we ask that you would grant us all repentance, and that you would deepen our faith as we dive down into your word at this time. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Well, Matthew chapter 7, verse 1 says, Judge not, that you be not judged. And this probably is one of the most misquoted verses in the entire Bible. It is the verse that pagans love to quote. Many self-identifying Christians also misapply this verse. You know, as soon as you say anything negative about someone's actions, you are immediately told not to judge. 
You know, God sees their heart. You can't see their heart. So don't judge. Well, it is true that you cannot see people's hearts, but we can see their fruit. And Jesus said, you will recognize them by their fruits. You know, on one occasion, Paul Washer, who at times can be quite the fiery preacher, was told to judge not lest he be judged. And in response, he said, twist not scripture lest ye be like the devil. And far too often has this passage of Scripture been twisted and ripped out of its context, and thus it is important for us to rightly understand what Jesus was addressing in this section. Because if someone is guilty of being judgmental simply because of telling someone to repent over their sinful actions, then many other passages of Scripture are going to need to be ignored. And I just want to read a couple of these passages so that you can get a feel and a, a taste for what I'm talking about. And I just want you to listen carefully. So you don't need to turn to these passages. If you're taking down notes, you can jot them down. But just listen to what these passages say. So in Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 17, Jesus said this. He said, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and as a tax collector." And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 3, the Apostle Paul said, It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans, for a man has his father's wife. And are you arrogant? Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. For though absent in body, I am present in spirit, and as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. And then a little later in verse 12, Paul says, For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? You see, there is actually a responsibility upon the church to make certain judgments. You see, to say judging is always wrong is simply wrong. It is better to say that there is a kind of judging that is wrong because the Bible speaks of judging in many different ways. And there are many forms of judgment that we might render in this world. And I just want to give you six brief examples that in a certain sense involves judging. So number one. One form of judgment is corrective in nature. Parents with children basically need to instruct and correct their children on a daily basis. And to correct your children sometimes require that you say, no, that is not the right way how to do this, but let me show you how to do this. So it's corrective in nature. Now, secondly, another form of judgment is to simply evaluate and it requires discernment. For example, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 15, Jesus said, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. We are not to be gullible people that just accept anything without making any analytical judgments. We are to be discerning people in order that we might discern truth from falsehood. Now, the judgment of evaluation can lead into the third form of judgment, which is the judgment of exposure. I mean, just think of the Apostle Paul and all the harsh and critical words that he had to say about false teachers, such as the false apostles in the book of 2 Corinthians and the Judaizers in the book of Galatians. Now, number four. There is also the judgment of purification. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17, it says, For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. 
Well, Peter isn't saying that the household of God is going to be condemned by God. Judgment in this case has to do with God refining and purifying his people through the various trials that he brings in our lives. Number five, there is also a disciplinary judgment. Uh, The Corinthians, for example, who partook uh, in the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner were judged by God. God killed some and, and some others became very ill. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 32, it says, But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined. So there is the judgment of discipline. And then number six, there is also the judgment unto condemnation. And by the way, this is the worst form of judgment to come under. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 5, it says, But they will give account... To him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. And as you know, this is, of course, referring to the final judgment. But all of these forms of judging that I have just talked about have nothing to do with the kind of judging that Jesus is addressing in our passage. And therefore, it is simply not true that every stripe of judging is wrong. But the question still remains. What form of judging is Jesus referring to when he says, Judge not that you be not judged? And the answer is found in verse 5. He says, You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye. You see, Jesus is against. In fact, he condemns and he despises all judging that is hypocritical. The judgment of hypocrisy is forbidden. And hypocritical judgment flows out of a self-righteous heart. And according to verse 2, you will reap what you sow. In verse 2 it says, For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use um, use, it will be measured to you. So this is a proverbial saying. And the point is that the same standard of judgment that you apply to others will be the same standard of judgment that others apply to you. I mean, this is just a basic principle as to how things generally work in life. And just verses later, Jesus taught us this very truth. It is called the golden rule. In verse 12, Jesus said, So whatever you wish that others would do to you, Do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. If you judge without mercy, then do not be surprised when others do not show mercy towards you. If you do not treat people with kindness, then do not be surprised when others do not treat you with kindness. If you fail to cover up people's minor offenses, then do not be surprised when others do not cover up yours. You see, to live in this manner is really a recipe for breaking relationships. And so with the same measure of judgment you pronounce, just know that it will be measured to you in the same way. I mean, what goes around comes around. You see, the rationale for not having this kind of judgmental attitude is because others, including God, will judge you in the very same way. You will reap what you sow. And ultimately, God is the one who will render the final judgment, uh, the final judgment and the final verdict over the matter. And His judgment is always just. It is never impartial. And so if you are unable to show mercy towards other people, then do not presume that God will show mercy to you. You see, this is really just taking us back to the fifth beatitude. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Now, when someone is guilty of rendering this kind of judgment, as it is outlined in verses 1 and 2, Jesus then, in a parabolical kind of way, explains what that person is like in verses 3 through 5. But let's just look at verses 3 and 4. He says, Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, Let me take the speck out of your eye, when there is the log in your own eye? 
Now, the scenario that Jesus presents us with is really quite ridiculous. And I don't mean that Jesus' teaching on this matter is ridiculous. I mean the one who judges in this manner is ridiculous. It's like they have a log in their eye, and yet they can only see the speck of dust in someone else's eye. Uh, The insincere critic who notices everyone else's fault but fails to see his own is like someone who has a beam in his eye and is unable to detect it. Now, obviously, Jesus isn't concerned about literal pieces of physical matter. He is speaking in hyperbolic language to illustrate the foolishness of this brand of judgmentalism. Jesus is concerned with his followers becoming preoccupied with, their, uh, with the failures of others while neglecting their own shortcomings. And as uh, we see in this passage, we know that Jesus has believers in mind because he is addressing one brother that is approaching another brother over a certain matter. And so when we treat other believers with harshness over their faults, and treat our own with insignificance, then we are deceiving ourselves. Uh, We cannot expect others to be dealing with their sins while simultaneously ignoring our own. Uh, You know the saying, uh, I'm sure you do, do as I say and not as I do. You know what that is? It's hypocrisy. And when we act that way toward one another, it doesn't bring us closer to one another It only causes our relationships to be very distant, and it pushes us apart. Now, I want to give you an example of someone who judged someone else for their sin when it was clearly not as great as their own sin. David was the man. I want you to go with me to 2 Samuel chapter 12. Let's look at 2 Samuel chapter 12, and I'm sure that you know the story, right? David was an adulterer. He committed adultery with Bathsheba, and he was also a murderer. He had Bathsheba's husband sent onto the front line in battle and then had the troops pulled back so that he would be killed. So he was both an adulterer and a murderer. And on one day, the prophet Nathan came to tell David a little story, and I want us to read that little story In 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 1 through 10, it says, And the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, There were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. And he brought it up, and it grew up with him and with his children. It used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup, and lie in his arms, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guests who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul and I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if this were too little, I would add to you as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah, the Hittite, to be your wife. When David had heard what the rich man had done to the poor man, uh, that is, in basically stealing his precious lamb, uh, David became infuriated 
when he heard about this and thought that the rich man deserved to die for having no pity on the poor man. David was angry over someone else's sin, but failed to see how serious his own sin was in the eyes of God. He thought that someone else deserved to die for for their sin, but didn't think the same when it came to himself, even though his sin was far worse. I mean, the rich man you know, stole a lamb, but David stole someone's wife. David was apt to see the failure of others, but failed to see his own. His own sin had blinded him. David had a log in his eye, and so Nathan had to point it out to him. He said, you are the man. And with the same measure that David used to judge, it was measured back to him by God because the sword would never depart from his house. The hypocritical judgment rendered by David led to severe consequences for himself and for his own household. Now, it's also important to underscore that David's life was not characterized by hypocrisy. And we know that he did repent of his sin, and we can read about it in detail in Psalm 51. And so the totality of David's life was not being lived in just a complete deception. He did not live a life of hypocrisy, but he clearly was guilty of hypocrisy on that occasion. Now, in the time of Jesus, we do know that there were, there were a group of people that you could really say did live lives of hypocrisy. They were known as the Pharisees. And the Pharisees were great at keeping their own traditions and very good at dressing themselves up very nicely on the outside. However, they were blind to their own weaknesses to the point that they were living a religious lie. Jesus rebuked them on several occasions because they did not practice what they preached. And Jesus called them snakes. He called them blind guides. He called them hypocrites, and he said that their father was the devil. And Jesus even told a whole parable about self-righteous people who trust in themselves and look down upon other people with disdain. And the example that he used was that of a Pharisee. The Pharisees were like blind doctors trying to perform eye surgery on those who could see better than they could. They thought that they were in the light, but in reality, they were in the darkness. And so when they would try to bring other people into the light, they were only bringing people into their own darkness. I mean, many of the Jews in Jesus' day were just like their teachers, hypocritical, proud, and deceived. And the Apostle Paul had something to say to them. And I want you to look at the first five verses in Romans chapter 2. So just go to Romans chapter 2 and look at the first five verses. Paul is here addressing the Jews, and this is what he says. In Romans 2, he says, Therefore you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges, for in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself. Because you, the judge, practice the very same things. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. When someone judges someone else for doing something that they themselves do, they are condemning themselves. But they're not only condemning themselves, They are the means uh, through which someone can become hardened to the things of God. If you look down at verses 21 through 24, uh, Paul says, You then who teach others, do you teach yourself? While you preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You abhor idols, do you rob temples? 
You who boast in the law dishonor God by breaking the law, for as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. You see, judgment that is hypocritical is not only not helpful, but it damages those who are the recipients of those judgments. And that's why all of the evangelistic endeavors of the Pharisees were absolutely useless and accomplished nothing. The hypocrisy of the Pharisees had a twofold effect. Number one, for those who were compelled by the message of the Pharisees and who joined their stock and practiced their religion, Jesus said that those people were made twice as much a child of hell as they were. Because these Gentiles only ended up being more deceived than they were before becoming one of their converts. Now, the second effect of hypocrisy is that it repels others, it hardens others, and it causes others to distance themselves from you, and that can only... Uh, and that will push them only further and further into their iniquity. I mean, just think of what the Apostle Paul said to the Jews that were acting hypocritically. He said that the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. In other words, you who are supposed to be preaching the gospel are making things worse, not better, Because your life clearly isn't adorning the message that you're proclaiming. Now those are the kinds of ramifications that hypocrisy can have upon an unbeliever. But the ramifications of having a hypocritical spirit among believers uh, is very serious as well. Creates conflict, creates tension and division and strife and bitterness. And the list goes on and on and on. So what must we do? Well, look at what Jesus tells us in verse 5. He says, you hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. It is very easy for us to spot um, the sins of other people while overlooking our own. We're very good at maximizing the weaknesses of others while minimizing our own. And so before seeking to remove the speck of dust that is out of someone else's eye, we need to examine our own lives to see if there is a log in our own. But I do want you to notice that addressing someone over their sin isn't what is being condemned here. You just need to make sure that you first take the log out of your own eye before doing so. I mean, just remember the prophet Nathan. I mean, Nathan was the one who confronted David over his sin. And Nathan wasn't being a hypocrite. In fact, Nathan was the one that God had used to bring about David's restoration. Now, we have a procedure on how to go about this in Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. Galatians 6, verses 1 through 3 gives us the procedure we need uh, to take in order to work for restoration when someone is caught in any transgression. In verse 1, it's, yeah, Paul says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks that he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. So when a brother or a sister in the Lord is caught in any transgression, then it is our job to restore that person in a spirit of gentleness. Now, confronting people is not always easy. It's not a whole lot of fun. And sometimes there can even be a temptation to think that we're pretty great because we haven't fallen into the same trap uh, than the one that we're seeking to restore. And so we need to be very careful that we do not become proud lest we deceive ourselves. The Bible tells us to take heed lest we fall. And so our aim in pointing out sin should never, ever, ever be condemnatory. Now, we are not to be nitpicky people that are constantly 
inspecting people's lives and just looking for every opportunity that we can to find uh, something that we can rebuke someone over. So we're not to be at each other's necks, constantly judging people's motives and doubting their sincerity. We want to err on the side of giving the judgment of charity. We want to err on the side of giving the benefit of the doubt. But when we do see clear violations of God's law, we need to approach that person in a spirit of gentleness to speak the truth in love because we know that that transgression will work ruin upon that person's life and and bring disrepute upon the gospel if we do nothing about it. And so we are to bear one another's burdens. We are to bear one another's burdens and fulfill the law of Christ. And we do that when we aim for restoration. Well, let's look at verse 6. Jesus said, Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. So while believers are not to be making hypocritical judgments, We are, nevertheless, to be very discerning toward the attitude that people have to the gospel message. And this seems to be what Jesus is talking about here when he mentions dogs and pigs. Uh, The kind of dogs that Jesus has in view here are not nice, uh, you know, household pets. They are wild scavengers that destroy everything that comes into their path. And pigs were animals that were ceremonially unclean in the Old Testament, and a Jew could not touch a pig, otherwise he or she would become ceremonially unclean. So to not give dogs what is holy, and to not throw your pearls before pigs, is to not give what is sacred to those who would profane it. Now Jesus does not have Gentiles, and he does not have Jews in mind when he says this. He is speaking about anyone that treats the gospel with contempt when it is presented to them. And by the way, what is holy um, is synonymous with pearls in that verse. It is speaking generally about those things that are sacred, that are set apart, that are consecrated unto God. It is the spiritual things, those things that pertain to the kingdom of God and to the gospel. And Jesus said, don't give it to those dogs and pigs, because if you do, they will do what they do best. They will destroy it underneath your feet, under their feet, and then they are going to turn and attack you. Now, what is Jesus teaching us here? Is he teaching us not to share the gospel with unbelievers? That's not what he's teaching at all. We know that's not what he's teaching, because At the end of the Gospel of Matthew, he commissions the church to go and disciple the nations, and it's our task to bring the Gospel to unbelievers. Jesus has a particular group of people in mind here. Jesus is speaking about people that have become very, very hardened in their sin and that don't display any openness, any degree of openness to the Gospel at all. In fact, they want to have nothing to do with it. And so when you speak about spiritual things to someone like that, someone that demonstrates animosity to it every time that you open your mouth, it is actually better to keep your mouth closed and to pray that God would soften that person's heart. Because if you are relentless and just never stop talking to someone uh, like that about the things of God, it is only going to make things worse on them and it's going to make things worse on you because they're going to turn to attack you. The same principle can be seen in the way that Jesus instructed his disciples when he sent them out to proclaim the good news of the kingdom. In Luke chapter 9, verse 5, Jesus said, And wherever they do not receive you, when you leave that town, shake off the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. Now, with all of that said, we also need to keep in mind that this doesn't mean that we aren't to share the gospel with people that are offended by it. Otherwise, there would be no one left to witness to because the Bible tells us that the word of the cross is an offense to those who are perishing. So let me just give you an example. Um, There was a guy in New Brunswick that my brother was witnessing to and evangelizing and sharing the gospel with. 
Um, and this guy ended up getting saved. And now he and my brother are very good friends. But before this guy got saved, whenever my brother would witness to him and was sharing the gospel, this guy wanted to punch my brother in the face. Okay, But now they're great friends um, because the Spirit of God did a work in that person's life. So there was anger. There was resistance. So we do not want to assume that we shouldn't share the truth with someone just because there is resistance, because there is usually always going to be a measure of of resistance. But there is a point when the resistance has become so strong that it is wiser to take the foot off the gas. William Hendrickson articulates what Jesus means here very well. He says, and I quote, Christ's disciples must not endlessly continue to bring the gospel message to those who scorn it. To be sure, patience must be exercised But there is a limit. A moment arrives when constant resistance to the gracious invitation must be punished by the departure of the messengers of good tidings. And that would be very consistent with what Jesus told his disciples in Luke chapter 9, that when people don't receive you, to move on somewhere else and to shake the dust off your feet. Because when a heart grows harder and harder and becomes more and more hostile to the message of the gospel, it is time to pull back. Now, you can pray for that person. You can show love to that person. You can perform kind gestures to that person. But that person's heart needs to be softened before he or she can be, uh, can be approached with the gospel again. You see, Jesus is really calling for his disciples to be wise and discerning in this matter. He doesn't want us to be spending all of our time on one individual when we are making absolutely no headway. He doesn't want us to be wasting our time when there is an entire world to reach for Christ. So in closing, there are three things that I want us to keep in mind from this passage. Number one, do not judge when there is a log in your own eye. We got to get rid of that sharp, contentious, and hypocritical spirit that looks down Upon others. Number two, when you need to confront someone, do it with a spirit of gentleness and always aim for restoration. And finally, exercise discernment toward those who are hardened in their sin and cease to cast the precious truths of the kingdom of God before them, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. Well, may God give us the grace and the wisdom to put all of this into practice. Amen.